Bright spots. If you were an interpreter back in the late 60s, the early, even into the early 80s, this would have been, been the sort of thing that you would be looking for in your seismic displays. So very often an interpreter would be looking through their seismic data. Certainly this looks like a good prospect here because it's a subtle structural feature, but it's also associated with an amplitude anomaly. Uh, we can see that the negative cycle here increases in amplitude uh, slightly. Uh, so this would be the reflection into um, a lower velocity gas sand. So we have a negative reflection coefficient. And then we have a, a reflection across the base of the reservoir, which is also has a higher amplitude than it does outside the gas saturated zone uh, because of the reduced velocity within the reservoir. So this would be a typical direct hydrocarbon indicator, a bright spot. And we're going to see, uh, based on the work of Domenico, that there are certain pitfalls associated with this um, uh, direct hydrocarbon indicator. And so a lot of the basic physics behind the bright spot uh, occurrence and its limitations and its interpretations is dissected in a couple papers by Domenico in 1974 and 1976. We're, we're basically going to focus on this paper here in 1974 and reproduce some of his calculations here. Uh, he uses, for example, a, a bulk density, which uh, is a function of the water saturation, uh, the density of the gas or the oil, the, the fluid filling the pore space, and the um, uh, sand grain density, the matrix. Uh, Density. He does not use the Wiley time average equation. Instead of the Wiley time average equation, he uses the Gertzma equation. Now, the Gertzma equation is shown here, and you can see that it has terms like uh, <clears throat> beta, which is the ratio of the compressibility of, of the sand to the bulk uh, compressibility, uh, the compressibilities of the sand and the fluid. Um, so this is this beta, this quantity here. The G sub B is the bulk reservoir shear modulus. And of course, phi is porosity and uh, so on. This is the bulk density. So this is the density defined in this term over here, which is also going to be saturation dependent. So we're going to get a different velocity for different values of water saturation. Uh, we're also going to see different uh, compressibilities. So these are some of the basic properties that Domenico incorporates into the calculations that he makes in his 1974 paper. We've got the Poisson's ratio, um, 0.39 to 0.24, and it doesn't really seem to vary much between 6,000 and uh, 10,000 feet. Drops significantly between 2,000 and 6,000 feet. We've got the various compressibilities here for reference and also the uh, densities over here. So these are some additional uh, relationships that are used in Domenico's 1974 paper. We've got the derivative of the density with respect to the water saturation, and that's uh, shown here. We have the shear rigidity, which is a function of the bulk compressibility, uh, but primarily a function of the um, uh, Poisson's ratio. And here we have the bulk compressibility, which is a function of, obviously, porosity, the pore volume compressibility, and the um, matrix compressibility, the uh, Sandy matrix. And then we have the fluid compressibility, which would be a function of both the water compressibility and the gas or oil uh, compressibility. And then again, over here, we've listed some of the uh, some of the constants, some of the constant values that are used by uh, Domenico in his calculations. And we're going to repeat a lot of these calculations, so you might want to pull out uh, Domenico's 1974 paper and kind of compare what we'll do. But I'll kind of throw in some of the comparisons and, and compare my calculations to uh, to his. But now the the sand has quite a bit of variations in Poisson's ratio, the compressibilities, and so on, so that we can use the Gertzma equation to calculate velocity. Uh, 
and we'll be doing this in order to calculate reflection coefficient. And the uh, uh, densities uh, and the velocities of the shale are more or less constant uh, at depths of 2,000, 6,000, and 10,000 feet with values of 2.14, 2.3, 2.4, 5,850, up to 9,660 feet per second. Uh, Poisson's ratio is just the ratio of the transverse to longitudinal strain, and it appears to kind of drop asymptotically or flatten out here around 0.24 at depths of 6,000 to 10,000 uh, feet. The compressibilities are just reciprocals of pressure and um, uh, reciprocal of the bulk modulus. And uh, so let's let's go on and take a look at some of the calculations here. Over here on the left, we're calculating the bulk bulk density at 10,000 feet, 6,000 feet, 2,000 feet using the relationship that uh, Domenico gives us. And we're looking at those calculations for water saturations that range from 0% to 100%, or fractional zero to uh, 100%. One, you know, all all pore space filled with water. And you can see that at 2,000 feet, uh, the bulk densities, when oil filled, uh, drop from a complete water saturated value of close to 2.04 to 1.91, and for gas saturated values down to uh, 1.62 or so. And we see the same. We see a greater decrease in the bulk density when the porosity is filled with gas than we do with oil, as we would, would expect because of its greater density, and uh, down here at 10,000 feet. So we see uh, <clears throat> the gap here kind of closes as we go from 2,000 feet to uh, 10,000 feet, and these lines more or less uh, parallel each other for oil as we go from 0% to 100%, or gas likewise from 0% to 100% per percent saturation, water saturation. Now the shale densities are held constant, as we mentioned, at 2.14, 2.3, and 2.4 at these different depths. And these densities will be combined with these densities to, to calculate uh, reflection coefficient. Now the fluid compressibility, now this is, this is what's really interesting about this study. We can see here that for a fairly small um, gas saturation here, let's say less than 5%, uh, between 95 and 100% water saturation, we get a very significant drop in the compressibility of the gas. Now remember, the compressibility of the gas shows up in the Gertzma equation. So it's, it's an important factor. And then you can see the uh, compressibilities for oil are not so dramatically affected uh, by changes in water saturation. They, they vary not quite linearly, but almost linearly uh, from 100% uh, water saturation to 0% to 100% oil saturation. So the point to take away here is that we see this really large decrease in or increase in compressibility. This is increasing compressibility in this direction with a very small uh, increase in gas saturation. So this gradient again is kind of constant as a function of depth and then all we're doing here is just comparing with the results that Domenico gets and we see. Uh, so I'm just kind of uh, uh, cross-checking my uh, calculations with uh, those presented by Domenico in his paper. Good agreement there. Okay, now we're looking at the velocity. So we're using the Gertzma equation here and we're calculating velocity. And this is equally interesting. This, this just kind of comes back to the point that we made here with regard to the compressibility. Remember the compressibility is a uh, uh, has a significant influence on the uh, on the velocity here. We have the uh, compressibility of the fluid over here in this uh, denominator, and and so 
as the uh, compressibility increases, we saw that over here, the compressibility increases very rapidly with a small amount of gas saturation, uh, the velocity drops significantly with an increase in gas saturation of you know less than 5%. We get a decrease in the velocity from a little bit over 6,000 feet per second down to 4,000 feet per second. Uh, we see that at each depth we get a significant drop in velocity associated with a small increase in gas saturation uh, or a small drop in water saturation associated with uh, uh, gas. With oil this uh, drop is again fairly subdued. It's nonlinear but it, it, it's, uh, we don't really see that that extreme drop in velocity for increased oil saturation as we go from right to left across this plot as we do over here for uh, the gas saturations. So that's an important takeaway and it kind of comes back to this relationship over here with the compressibilities. And then this also translates into the reflection coefficients that we calculate. Uh, just using um, the impedance for the sand minus the impedance for the shale over the sum of the two impedances. And, uh, Z, the impedance, is just the product of the uh, density and the um, density and the uh, velocity. And I've got that stuck in there, but hopefully you can see that we get this really significant increase in reflectivity. Uh, for a really small increase in gas saturation here. So in that bright spot that we were looking at at the beginning, we could get a significant brightening, a significant reduction in velocity with a very small increase in uh, gas saturation. And that's kind of the takeaway here. So Domenico presents his plot kind of upside down, he presents the absolute value of the amplitude ratio and we're just looking at the um, we're looking at the uh, actual values here. So we have negative reflection coefficients uh, across the top of the gas sand. And over here this is just a comparison again just to show that the uh, um, it mainly a cross check for me just to see that uh, my calculations are coinciding with those of Domenico's. Okay, so one of the, the, ba the basic pitfall I think that you can see with this uh, DHI approach to this bright spot approach to interpretation is that you may see a bright spot like this. And these, these bright spots early on, interpreters recognized that the basic pitfall here was that you could have a nice bright spot, you could drill into it, but it wouldn't necessarily have a lot of gas in it because it only took a small amount of gas to produce a large decrease in the reflection coefficient. So that would be one of the um, lessons learned back in the 70s and of course Domenico's paper kind of dissects this all for us and kind of reveals the, uh, you know, the basic physics associated with the, um, uh, the bright spot. Uh, you can get bright spots with a fairly small amount of gas saturation. So another thing to point out is that the bright spot approach assumed normal incidence reflectivity and um, in the beginning in the early 80s we see increased focus of attention on amplitude variations with offset. And the amplitude variations with offset can add significant uh, complexity to the uh, interpretation and even tying your normal incidence uh, seismic uh, uh, synthetic to, uh, to the seismic section, but uh, the normal incidence approach to amplitude interpretation. So next time we'll continue on, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Amplitude variations with offset. So thanks for uh, joining me and see you next time.